today's webinar. Today is our 10th webinar of the series. We are honored to have with us Dr. Jawhar Ali from the International Rice Research Institute, Philippines. Uh, sir, uh, you're a pioneer in your field of research. Uh, we would love to know how you started your career. Uh, please tell us about your journey so far as a plant scientist. Yeah, my journey actually was really very interesting. Uh, right in the beginning, if I remember, uh, as a child actually, as a child of school going kid, I uh, had a deep interest in, uh, we were located near to the uh, IARI, Indian Agriculture Research Institute. So very often uh, I would go through those fields. And early on, I, uh, I got this uh, uh, liking for agriculture. And uh, I took a chance, uh, I took, uh, after matriculation, I joined uh, my BS Agriculture in Punjab Agriculture University, Ludhiana. Uh, there was a program to join after 10th. I said, why should I waste my 10th and 11th and 12th degree to, and then join uh, and I could save a year from that. Uh, so I joined after matriculation and I saved one year of my time. Actually, it was a five-year program. Then after joining there, uh, I remember uh, uh, I had been very great, uh, hugely influenced by uh, stalwarts, rice stalwarts like M. S. Swaminathan, uh, Dr. Gurudev Kush, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Siddiq. Uh, they, they were actually uh, my, uh, in many ways, they were like mentors for, for me everything. And uh, I had the opportunity uh, to listen to Dr. Kush uh, in the front rows. I was sitting as an undergraduate student of BS Agriculture in the front rows of the auditorium, listening to Dr. Kush when he was presenting the IR36 uh, uh, rice variety was being uh, sh uh, showcased. So at the, uh, in Punjab Agriculture University, I was in the front rows listening to him very, uh, that really moved my uh, uh, um, me towards more towards uh, crop breeding and genetics, and uh, I I took uh, MS in genetics uh, later at Indian Agriculture Research Institute, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, had the opportunity at that time. I remember 1988, IRA introduced the entrance exam at that time. Many people uh, maybe uh, may not be aware when IRA introduced the entrance exam, and to my uh, good luck or bad luck, I don't know. I, I was introduced, uh, I was interviewed by more than uh, 400 people were interviewed for MS position for seven slots of MS degree in genetics. And I was lucky to get through, uh, I was a fourth ranker at that time. But anyway, so it was really exciting for me uh, to get into IRI for, uh, and it's a very premier institute in this region, in, especially in India. And uh, and then I had the opportunity to work on uh, chemical gametocytes that are chemical gametocytes or we call it as chemical hybridizing agents for my masters. Uh, mm -hmm. That was time when no CMS lines were available in India. Uh, unlike, uh, because this was a technology coming from China, then it came to ERI, uh, some of these materials and ERI was breeding these materials and these ERI bred CMS lines didn't enter India at that time in 88. And mm -hmm. we worked on uh, chemical hybridizing agents as an alternative approach to selectively sterilize the males and leaving the females uh, fertile. And mm -hmm. that way, can we produce chemically hybridized hybrids? So that was my MS thesis all about. And we discovered a group of chemicals called oxanilates. Uh, mm -hmm. And that sparked a lot of interest at that time. And uh, then I did my PhD also on two-line uh, hybrids. Uh, at that time, uh, Mariama in 1990 was one of the lead uh, scientists who discovered the TGMS in uh, Japonica background in Norin PL12. And at the same time uh, in India, uh, 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 the, the scientists were looking how to get it done for Indian context. And uh, at that time, this uh, a team went to uh, Japan to Mariama's lab and uh, the materials were not to be shared with India at that time uh, okay. because of the huge costs. Uh, mm -hmm. They were demanding a very huge money for that. So then the, 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 the thesis problem came in IRI and they said, can we do repeat uh, mutation breeding for that? I said, uh, how can you search a needle in the haystack mm -hmm. for hitting correctly that particular gene? Mm -hmm. But then, then we took our chances and I did a, a mutation breeding with chemical and physical mutations. And I was lucky to get eight uh, TGMS lines we developed. And that was uh, a very path-breaking uh, effort. And uh, it was our 
India's first uh, approach where we could develop uh, our own TGMS line uh, mm -hmm. in Indica background for the first time. And this uh, triggered the two-line hybridized research in India, and for which I was awarded the Jawaharlal Nehru Award uh, for Outstanding PhD Thesis. And then uh, I joined uh, Dr. S.K. Raina for my, uh, uh, who was also uh, one of the very great scientists on double haploids at that time, and he's still there uh, in uh, some private sector. And uh, the, the double haploid uh, breeding approach uh, was a very good approach by which you can quickly fix the uh, any kind of material uh, segregating and reach the farmers much faster. So this uh, learning from him uh, helped me to uh, uh, speed up much of the breeding activities uh, in the later part when I was trying to fix material. Okay. Coming to, uh, then I came to, uh, I was selected for the uh, two-line hybridized uh, uh, postdoc at IRI under Dr. Virmani. And Virmani is one of the uh, stalwarts for hybridized, who was the first two uh, IRI scientists who brought this technology to Asia and shared uh, much of the materials uh, initially from uh, Iris uh, germ plasm to uh, the uh, members in, in different parts of the world. And uh, Iri could uh, uh, promote uh, hybridized technology outside China in Asia specifically. And much of the work uh, credit goes to Dr. Virmani, with whom I had a good association with him uh, uh, for uh, uh, in that time uh, when I was working for two line. And then I moved on uh, from there to uh, serve the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University at uh, Agriculture College and Research Institute at uh, Trichy, uh, where I was trying to do uh, salt tolerant hybrids, uh, which were uh, never in, we never thought of uh, developing stress tolerant hybrids at that early. You imagine uh, sometime in 95, uh, we had an ICR project grant from ad hoc project uh, mm -hmm. and also NATP project also we got and uh, uh, on T2 line hybridized project as well. So these projects uh, uh, helped me to develop the first uh, salt tolerant hybrid, especially sodic city tolerant hybrid, CORH2 uh, from Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, uh, which did very well in the sodic conditions where the pH is more than nine. And this hybrid did very well, more than 1.5 tons over the best uh, Czech hybrid uh, inbreds at that time. And then this journey from there, I came to, uh, 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 I was, uh, uh, after serving five years there, I came back to IRI again for a second round of postdoc uh, under the Rockefeller Foundation uh, granted uh, project where uh, I could uh, work with a very uh, lead scientist, uh, a genome uh, a specialist at that time was Dr. Zikang Li and he's uh, also was the GSR project leader as, uh, from Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences. And uh, he was one of the very lead scientists with whom I had the opportunity to work with him as a postdoc in 2000 to 2003 as a project scientist at Erie. And that is where I learned, I was the first uh, generation of the molecular breeders uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, where, which invested on molecular breeders at that time. At that time, the technology was mostly on the SSR markers, uh, uh, moving away from the RAPD markers and all those markers and came to SSR. SSR was considered as uh, the best uh, market at that moment and everybody working like uh, day and night i remember still uh, many people uh, working uh, uh, like a shifts night shift and day shift in the marker lab in erie and uh, this was a very exciting site more than 15 postdocs in uh, in that lab uh, called genome uh, mapping lab gml it was popularly called and uh, 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 then, the, uh, then I, uh, after this uh, project scientist, I moved to a place uh, where I was uh, under Iri Iran project. Uh, I moved to Iran for six years to lead their uh, molecular breeding and the hybrid program there. And I developed uh, and helped in the development and deployment of uh, Bahar One, which is uh, one of the very high yielding hybrids uh, using the Iri germplasm. And uh, later also we developed about six hybrids, uh, uh, very high yielding hybrids for this country. And then uh, uh, I came to IRI as the GSR project scientist, uh, uh, leading the GSR project at IRI in 2009. Uh, uh, and this uh, uh, was at a time when uh, this uh, whole thing uh, was uh, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation 
and Iri was a sub grantee of Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences, and we were entrusted to develop uh, and breed uh, materials in the tropical context. Uh, whereas China is in temperate conditions, and it, uh, it was a big challenge to uh, adapt the materials uh, coming from there. So we had to do a whole fledged, uh, full fledged breeding at Iri uh, to acclimatize and completely tropicalize the materials. And that's how the GSR breeding strategy evolved. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it helped us to map many of the traits related to uh, many abiotic stresses. And that's this 10 year period from 2009 to 2019 mm -hmm. was the most glorious period for me in my career where I could, uh, uh, but my dream was fulfilled when I joined ERI, uh, to be honest uh, with you all that. It was like uh, joining ERI was something like uh, like a, something like a dream come true for a kid when I was uh, uh, just thinking of just going to Punjab Agriculture University and then from IRA and then coming to IRI and then becoming a scientist at IRI uh, was really a very pleasant moment for me. And uh, really, I, I feel uh, uh, that uh, the, the opportunity that IRI gave me to uh, unleash my potential uh, mm -hmm. is uh, very much uh, acknowledged. And I, I feel for all youngsters that they should always aspire to come to Erie and uh, get connected with us. Uh, this is a very good opportunity for everyone. So uh, I could release about 50, 28 varieties directly bred by me in less than seven to eight years and reaching 2.7 million hectares and uh, almost 2.2 uh, .2 million farmers touched. 110 of these materials are in the pipeline in different countries to be released. So how productive you can be beyond this, I, I don't realize. And now uh, with the hybrids that we are developing, we have hundreds of hybrids in the pipeline that will hit the uh, commercialization wing very soon. And uh, this is uh, what is the potential uh, of these materials will be unleashed as we go along. So uh, this is where uh, my journey uh, uh, of uh, leading the hybridized program at Diri, where we uh, revitalized the hybridized development consortium and today we have 88 members from public and private sector. And uh, this uh, is a very good platform where uh, the public and private sectors come together and learn a lot of uh, uh, things where we share our materials with this, uh, sec this platform. And we get uh, nominal fees from them and uh, a nominal uh, uh, licensing fees that goes back into research again of IRI's uh, mandate to serve the poor farmers in the world to produce the costs and all those things. I think uh, I, I don't want to extend more than this. I think this is where uh, the journey ends and it's still very bright for me to uh, move along and uh, uh, some other time I will tell you the rest part of the story as we go along. Thank sure, you. Sir, sir um, how important a role uh, will hybrid rice play in feeding the billions in the future? <clears throat> you see, the, the hybrid rice is such a wonderful technology. Uh, uh, it's, it, you have to understand the core of the uh, issue here. What is your parents is what is your F1. Mm -hmm. If you design your parents uh, according to the requirements of the market segments, and definitely the hybrids will perform the same way. Mm -hmm. And if you have very good system of uh, market segmentation and understanding market requirements and breeding the right parental lines for different, definitely the hybrids can give 25 to 30% yield. Now, 25 to 30 percent yield means 25 to 30 percent uh, resources you are saving. Like, suppose you have 100 hectares of land uh, of uh, inbreds, and I want to put uh, in terms of production, if I just have to use hybrids, I will get it done in 70 hectares, the same yield. Hmm. So, 30 hectares is saved, in a, uh, just to understand uh, in a layman's language that. 30, per 30 hectares of uh, inputs is saved, 30% of the labor is saved, 30% of the uh, inputs that is very costly these days are being saved. So hybrid technology uh, does so much in that front. Then you have the, uh, the second layer of uh, the, uh, the it gives employment generation to the industry. It also uh, helps the farmers to come out of this, uh, uh, the, the so-called uh, one ton uh, uh, means the marginal advantages that they get from inbred technologies. Uh, of course, inbred technology is important, but uh, it has to be utilized in places where the 
the manifestation of the heterosis is maximized. Where you get 25 to 30%, definitely one should exploit. So when you translate this into a larger uh, area, now 8 million hectares outside China is hybridized. If we can touch 15 million hectares in the next 10 years, I'm sure that we can meet the challenge of 2050 to feed globally, especially who are depending on rice as their staple diet. I think I will stop here. Uh, uh, sir, uh, along with uh, food security, what are your thoughts on nutritional security of rice? Yeah, this is a very important topic. I think uh, it's a very important uh, thing that the second dimension of food security has to go along with uh, the nutritional security. And uh, I also mentioned in my uh, first slide, even I uh, mentioned that to uh, for the viewers, that this uh, nutritional security is so vital that it's the the, it is not just food security is just not uh, just solving the hunger, but the uh, hidden hunger is solved by the nutritional security. There are a lot of hidden hunger in terms of zinc requirements, dietary requirements of iron, zinc, and many other uh, elements that is uh, missing in many of our uh, uh, diets. And by putting these things in uh, right perspective and uh, making a mainstreaming of uh, breeding methodologies by which we incorporate zinc and iron uh, into our all breeding pipelines, uh, this can be resolved and uh, very easily it can be done. It's just some few major genes that is required to be brought into the uh, breeding pipelines uh, where we can use them even in the forward breeding approach. One or two markers for that to, to select automatically those uh, materials and we can forward it and very easily it can be done and anybody can do it it's not uh, uh, some lead institution doing it any breeder uh, with that uh, mindset should be able to involve uh, the zinc and iron to be incorporated in their breeding programs uh, but one thing uh, one caution here is one has to be very careful when you are using this type of heavy metals like uh, zinc specifically they have a lot of interaction with uh, other heavy metals as well so uh, in places where uh, arsenic and uh, cadmium, they have huge interactions and interplays between these type of uh, heavy metals. So one should not uh, put them, their uptake mechanisms are similar. So one has to be very careful in breeding uh, zinc rich uh, materials, but uh, not to be deployed in places where arsenic is a problem. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, deployment has to be very careful. So therefore the market segment analysis is very important before deployment strategy is done. So this is the future, uh, uh, very important for uh, nutritional security. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, what new tools and techniques will be important for rice breeding in the future? I think uh, this is a very uh, important, we are evolving actually uh, from simple marker estate breeding in the past uh, and simple breeding marker estate was considered as a big uh, tool at that time. And then we came on to uh, the, uh, the whole genome sequences were done. And now uh, when all the molecular markers and high density maps are available, we know more uh, information on the genotype of the materials that we are breeding. We can play with these, uh, the whole genome sequences to our uh, advantage uh, where we can uh, easily pull them, pyramid them uh, uh, and do many things, uh, including the genomic selection nowadays is the buzzword. I think uh, genomic selection by using elite by elite founder lines uh, certainly should uh, help in uh, advancing the uh, genetic gains uh, much rapidly. But uh, the, the, for the youngsters, I see that this, uh, the new tools uh, mostly related to computers and uh, related to gene sequencing should not tie them up with the computers and uh, servers and running after the data, but without looking at the plants in the field. Uh, my breeding always came from the field evaluation and selection and then uh, fully and, uh, uh, enforced with uh, the genomic knowledge of the materials and their, uh, how they move in the structure and then analyzed uh, them and uh, using de design QTL pyramiding. So the GSR breeding technology, the design QTL pyramiding approaches and uh, the rapid uh, generation cycles to uh, maximize your genetic gains. We call nowadays speed breeding and a lot of good publications are there where you can do uh, six seasons in a year uh, in barley and other crops. Uh, for rice still it is uh, three and a half crops you can take uh, in a year, but uh, that, that's a challenge. But this can really rapidly, you can advance your generations and genetic gains can be maximized. Uh, and above that, if you use some of the 
uh, best uh, breeding strategies like genomic selection, uh, GSR breeding strategies, design PPL pyramiding. I think these can do wonders for any breeding program. And this can be extended to not only rice, any crop. Uh, don't get restricted. This is, this is open to any crop and these are, uh, most of the crops are being used uh, by our sister uh, CG centers as well. Okay, so, uh, sir, uh, now uh, we'll conclude with uh, one last question. Uh, what would your words of advice be to the young research fellows out there? I think uh, uh, the words of advice, I, I'm not in a position to give advice to anyone, but uh, some of the youngsters, I think uh, uh, what I would suggest them is there is no, uh, no replacement to hard work. No matter uh, you do anything, you have to put uh, all your dedication, your efforts, and these are proven pathways already. It's not that uh, we are going for the first time learning something. Uh, you have to use the proven pathways of people who have experienced, and I'm telling you that it was not an easy journey for me to reach here. And if you have to do, it was sheer hard work, hard work, hard work, and, uh, and true dedication to see that your materials reach the farmers. So there should be some kind of a driving force or passion to drive you exactly. So sometimes this passion drives you to be dedicated and you always remember that, look at that uh, poor farmer there in somewhere, your materials will be utilized. Can that bring spines to his faces? Uh, that is what drives me personally. And that uh, motivates me every day. Okay, somebody is using my material and trying to benefit by even half a ton uh, in the best conditions. It's good that that uh, gives a lot of rewarding, self-rewarding yourself that uh, somebody is benefited out of it. And then uh, the, apart from this, uh, the, uh, some of the uh, students, they have to understand that it's not, uh, uh, they have to put uh, very dedicated efforts uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to get to the bottom of it, basically. Like you should be passionate, you should have inquisitive mindset, uh, you should try to go to the bottom of everything, not just look at the top and just do something mm -hmm. and uh, superficially touch it, but get to the bottom of it. And this is very important for youngsters, especially in the jet set age of modern computers and uh, gadgets and uh, uh, media and all those things. So they get often diverted. Uh, so uh, they should go deeper. A deeper dive is very essential for science. And unless you get satisfied personally, I don't think no better rewarding than your self-satisfaction and mm -hmm. what you're doing at the end of the day. I think uh, I, I, I like to just uh, uh, put this uh, as a prick to the, uh, the budding scientists so, so that they start get started right away. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we will now go back 